Welcome everybody to a Striatech hosted journal club. My name is Thomas Münch and I am one of the founders of Striatech. In our journal club series, different scientists present their projects and new data, highlighting the use and the applications of our Optodrum device. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Nico Michiels as our speaker. Um, Nico is professor in animal evolutionary ecology at the University of Tübingen. He will talk about echolocation with light, a new form of active sensing in fish. Before Nico's talk, I will give a short introduction. Please let me highlight that throughout this event, you can ask questions and we will have time to answer and discuss your questions at the end. A quick word about Striatech. Striatech is a dynamic biotech company from Tübingen in Germany. We specialize in the development of neuroscience testing tools, in particular for vision research. The Striatech founders are all experienced neuroscientists in the field of vision research. Today's journal club is a bit different than our previous journal clubs. In our previous journal clubs, which are all available on our website to watch on demand, a common theme was diseases. Diseases that in one way or another affect vision. Our previous speakers talked about those diseases, about the treatment approaches and how our Optodrum helped them to characterize the vision of their model mouse lines. Today's talk is not about disease. It is much more fundamental. It is about life itself, about survival, about finding food and avoiding predators. It is about evolutionary adaptations that help to survive. Nico Michels, our speaker today, is an experienced and enthusiastic diver and he discovered a completely new and unknown phenomenon, namely that some fish species generate something like light search beams perfectly adapted to detect prey and predators that are otherwise impeccably camouflaged. Nico is an evolutionary ecologist and he has traveled the world in his academic positions. He has worked in Hasel in Belgium, at Brown University in the US, at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and as a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Behavioral Physiology in C. Wiesen. He then became professor at the University of Münster, and in 2004, he moved to Tübingen, where he is now. Previously, his work focused on reproductive ecology of dragonflies, with a focus on copulation, genital morphology, and sperm competition, and on the sexual mechanisms of several hermaphrodite species. In 2007, though, he completely shifted his research focus. Nico noticed that many fish species have bright, almost glowing eyes. Through many years of research and really clever experiments, he could prove that these eyes function just like headlights in, in a car. The fish use that to spot prey and predators. Today, Nico will tell us about this discovery and his exciting scientific journey over the last couple of years. Before you start, Nico, let me remind the audience that you will be able to ask questions throughout the event and also to give a thumbs up to other questions. A quick word about asking questions. The interface can be a bit confusing. When you want to ask a question, the cursor by default is in the name field. Giving your name is optional, but you have to click into the question field before you start typing your question. The Q&A panel on the right will stay available for a couple of days after the live event. So if you are currently watching a recording of the event, and Q&A is still available, 
please make sure to enter your question and your name so that we can back to you with the answer. We are very much looking forward to your question. So Nico, please uh, go ahead with your presentation. And make sure to unmute yourself. OK, here I am. I assume you hear me and I assume you can see my slides. Is that right? Yes, just yes. Very good. OK, thank you very much, Thomas, for a nice introduction. Um, I'm um, quite excited to be able to speak in front of this audience. Um, it's uh, a story that, as Thomas already said, has been unraveling for uh, during the last uh, like uh, 13, 14 years or so. And uh, it is true it started with the accidental discovery of the fact that um, a lot of fish have very bright red fluorescent irises. And, um, and even more, so after very soon I became to start to realize that it's not just fluorescence. There's very many structures in fish eyes that make the eyes the brightest part of a fish. You can actually see this in any aquarium, in any zoo. If you walk around and you pay attention, you will notice that the eyes are often the brightest part of the whole animal. Now, obviously, most people would immediately think, well, this has something to do with signaling or might improve vision in some way. Um, and I fully agree that particularly for signaling, there's probably a lot of uh, possibilities that uh, these mechanisms are being used. But we got interested in the option that uh, maybe there's more behind this and these structures are also used as a light source that might improve detection. In the talk that I'm going to present you today, I'm going to focus on detection of cryptic predators because that is of course very relevant for a small fish. Imagine being a very small fish hopping around, hopping around on the substrate on a near a coral reef like uh, this picture is from um, and you encounter a deadly scorpion fish. I don't know who has seen the fish here, but this here is the outline of a scorpion fish, which is the devil scorpion fish, which is superbly camouflaged in its environment. This is its mouth. This is its eye. This is one of its pectoral fins. And so obviously benthic fish, substrate dwelling fish have a problem. In order to understand how small fish can use light to solve this issue of uh, difficult, challenging detection, I'm going to go through some physics first before getting into some neurophysiology and then ending with experiments, behavioral experiments that we do or have carried out in this context. So first something about optics you need to know. This is a scorpion fish, it's a tropical species, and it seems as if it's superbly camouflaged, but it is quite easy to make its eye light up like a cat's eye. We call this eye shine, and as you notice, eye shine means the light is coming out of the eye through the pupil. It is inside the eye that there is a reflective layer that bounces back the incoming light. And because it is a focusing eye, the light is sent back to the source. This specific property of light being sent back to the source means that if you have a light source, let's say at arm's length, and you look at a scorpion fish, you wouldn't notice anything. But as soon as you hold that light source close to your own eyes, all of a sudden those eyes start to beam the light back at you as if there are little mirrors in these eyes. So eye shine can be easily induced by an external source. However, one important requirement has to be fulfilled, namely that source needs to be really close to the observer's eyes. Now in the field, of course, uh, fish do not have uh, electricity or other ways of producing light. Um, I'm also focusing on daytime fish, so not on uh, chemiluminescent fish that produce chemical light at night. So what are, what are fish capable of doing during the day? 
obviously the only source they can use is sunlight. And this is what we are focusing on. We are focusing on the possibility that fish use downwelling su sunlight to send it sideways through reflective structures around their eyes or parts of their body, as uh, exemplified by this barracuda, which seems to briefly redirect light in my direction to inspect me. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, many years ago, uh, just like a coincidental picture. Now, barracudas are relatively hard to work with, so um, we resolve, resorted to a different species, which is this very small uh, black-headed triple fin, and uh, the reason why we started to look at this species is because it has this really interesting possibility of switching a little white light on and off on its iris. This phenomenon is uh, shown in more detail here. We call that an ocular spark and it is extremely bright. Uh, you don't see this from this image, but in the field it looks like a little diamond that is glistering uh, glistening on the on the edge of the iris. And the reason why this is possible is because in almost all fish, the lenses, which are spherical, will stick out of the pupils. And as a consequence, downwelling light that strikes the head will at least partly pass through the lens, but be focused, not enter the pupil, and then be focused at the lower edge of the uh, iris. So this is something that also produces light in or around the eye, but it is not eye shine, so don't mix this up with eye shine. Remember that eye shine is light that comes out of the pupil. In this case, we're looking at focused sunlight being reflected sideways. And as I already said, we call this an ocular spark. There was no terminology for this. Um, here we see a, a triple fin using an ocular spark in the field. Um, the, uh, you can see them quite frequently. Uh, you can also see them easily in the lab. Uh, so under many conditions, you can see these ocular sparks. Now, I'm sure from your perspective, this doesn't look like a serious uh, light source. This is just a, a little speck of white pigment reflecting a bit of sunlight. Uh, but you shouldn't underestimate uh, the power of indirect light and I've illustrated this by crumbling a piece of uh, paper and just coming close with my hand and as, I, as you can see even my hand can be a light source assuming the distances are short enough. So remember this short distances a small world can be sufficient to use weak indirect light sources. And that is exactly the life of a triple fin. This is the environment in which it lives. There's a small individual on its substrate here that just a few centimeters long and all the interactions they have within their environment are taking place within a few centimeters. One thing that is extremely dangerous for a triple fin are scorpion fish. Scorpion fish sit on the substrate. They're motionless, super cryptic predators. The species that we work on is different from the tropical species that I showed in the beginning. It's the black scorpion fish, and the black scorpion fish has this feature that just like the tropical uh, species has extremely retroreflective eyes, as demonstrated in this short clip, which shows how a little strip of paper just moved up and down in front of the eye of a scorpion fish uh, results in retroreflective eye shine. So we have a situation in the field that looks like this. We have a triple fin on the one side that has ocular opportunity to produce op ocular sparks, which are focused sunlight. And on the other hand, there's these dangerous predators lurking on the substrate, very well camouflaged, but with a highly reflective pupil. So could it be that one has something to do with the other? Is it possible that flickering light here uh, affects the ability to detect the uh, scorpion fish. We call this process diurnal active photolocation. Um, the hypothesis that we test in this research is that triple fins redirect sunlight using their eyes to improve their ability to detect scorpion fish 
by making the eyes of the scorpion fish blink. Let's move into the neurophysiology part of this uh, presentation. The first question is a theoretical question. Is it even conceivable? Is it theoretically possible that triple fins can perceive the reflection of their own redirected light in the pupil of a nearby scorpion fish? Over the years, we've collected all the data that allow us to calculate how much light comes down into the sea at 10 meters depth, how much of that light is then reflected from the Oculus Spark towards the scorpion fish that sits at the distance D. We know the size of the eyes and all these structures. We know how much of that light is reflected back towards the triple fin, and we know how much of that light enters the pupil of the triple fin and is there available for visual perception. So the question is, of course, now, can this resultant fluctuations in the eye of the scorpion fish be perceived? We have uh, all the data, all the optical properties and spectral sensitivities that we need for the triple fin to notice in order to understand the contrast sensitivity, so how subtle are the differences in contrast in the eye that the triple fin can perceive. We used Striatek's Optodrum and published a little paper to that, together with Thomas to describe the uh, response of triple fins to various patterns of um, gratings with different uh, cycles per degree and also different contrast values. And this is the uh, contrast sensitivity curve showing that the highest contrast sensitivity is here with relatively low spatial frequencies. It goes down for high spatial frequencies. And you see that in this region, triple fins are certainly capable of getting a reaching a contrast sensitivity of 125, which coincides with a Michelson contrast of 0.8%, which is very little. Um, I have a very weak banding pattern here, which has a Michelson contrast that is more than 0.8%. So triple fins, according to this uh, study, are apparently capable of seeing contrasts that are even weaker than the contrast here in this part of the slide. Putting all together, we can calculate over which distance triple fins would be able or should be able to see variation in contrast in the eyes of a scorpion fish that sits at these distances here. Um, this is depending on two different um, key parameters. On this parameter side, we see the, the reflectance of an ocular spark expressed as a proportion uh, relative to the downwelling light. And on the other axis, we see the retroreflective index. Um, this is a proportion, so this is 10 times, 15 times, 20 times the uh, strength of uh, what is coming in uh, relative to a white standard, a diffuse white standard. And these are the values that flow into our model to calculate these distances. So you can see triple fins should be able to detect the eye of a scorpion fish or the blinking of an eye of a scorpion fish across 7 to 10 or 12 uh, centimeters. Now, this is, of course, a, a mathematical model with a lot of simplified uh, assumptions. One of the key assumptions that is very simplified here is that the sunlight is constant. Now, obviously, sunlight is not constant. And one of the things we're pursuing right now is that we're trying to calculate how this, this flicker, which is very characteristic, particularly in shallower water, might affect this whole business of active photolocation. So for the last two field campaigns, we've been going into the field, putting up spectrometers like this, uh, aimed at a, white, a piece of white standard here to measure the fluctuations and light intensity in absolute sense uh, that comes down at that particular depth. And you get uh, values like this, for instance, as shown on the left. Here's some more graphs for 10 meters and 15 meters depth. As you can see, not surprisingly, the amount of light goes down with increasing depth. But you can also see that the, the variation of this uh, flicker uh, 
reduce is strongly reduced with increasing depth. So that is the, the temporal structure and luminance that we can measure at one particular spot. Now you may have wondered what this strange box is behind the spectrometer. This is another approach here. We have a video camera hidden behind this uh, diffuser plate and underneath the diffuser, diffuser is a, a special um, like a template with little holes and these little holes are in exactly half a centimeter from each other and we use them to assess the spatial structure of the flicker that reaches the surface. So using these data we can um, calculate over what distances uh, strong contrasts between temporarily less illuminated and temporarily more illuminated parts of the substrate are. We can combine these data sets and then get uh, data like this, for instance. So here, here we see the flicker in five meters again. You see these very strong uh, contrasts. Oops, sorry, let's go back. So uh, this is distance between two points on the surface in our template. And you can see as you go further away from one point, the other point will show more and more variation and around seven centimeters approximately, you get some kind of a bit of a stabilization. You have a very wide variation. It's quite logical that very close to one point, you very often get light that is very similar to the light that exists at this point at any point in time, regardless of whether it's dark or light. But as you go further away, you are more likely to get extremes, both to the upper and lower part of the possibilities. We can combine this and then, for instance, say, OK, let's look at everything, all the points that uh, we have at a distance of seven centimeters between the observer and a potential target, and then look at the temporal pattern that we can see across this distance. And this allows us to identify points where there is a particular high level of contrast uh, that uh, strongly exceeds what we would get if we would just use the average value of light at a particular depth. Now, this is very much work in progress. We are still in the process of implementing this kind of spatial and temporal complexity into the visual modeling, but that's uh, working quite well. And one thing that I already can say for sure is that it's pretty certain that detection over 10 centimeters or more is realistic under these uh, flickering light conditions. Now, uh, having said that, so yes, we, can, we would say yes, these fish can indeed respond to the flicker or can indeed see the flicker that they induce in the eyes of the scorpion fish, but do they use it? Is this also something that we can see in their behavior? Now we're entering the behavioral part of my talk. In this part, I'm going to ask the question, can we provide any experimental evidence that fish are actually employing or using active photolocation? Our first goal and a very challenging goal was to develop a methodology to manipulate Oculus Sparks. For this purpose, we developed a, a method to attach tiny little plastic shading hats to those small fish. We use surgeon uh, glue. This is some kind of super glue. These hats stick very well for a day or so, but then start to fall off. And uh, in most cases, they fall off after two or three days and the fish doesn't even notice that it had something uh, before. So it's a non-invasive technique. Uh, the advantage is that here I can be sure that this fish cannot produce ocular sparks, whereas this fish is still capable of producing ocular sparks. In pilot experiments, we could show that the general behavior of these fish was unaffected. Um, the crucial thing we wanted to know, of course, is whether fish with the control treatment or no treatment uh, would be better at detecting a scorpion fish than fish with such a shading hat. In the first experiments, we added the triple fins to the scorpion fish the night before we started to record. Uh, so these data that I'm going to show are for a time period 
uh, of at least 12 hours following the combination of the fish. What we saw, oh, so this is just to illustrate how it looks like. So behind the glass separator, the, the three different fish types get to see a scorpion fish or as an alternative treatment, a stone. Um, and we then uh, recorded the position of the fish relative to uh, the treatment. So the treatment is behind glass, illustrated here in this scheme. Um, these uh, three different types were always placed together in the aquarium. And uh, the hypothesis that is being tested here is that they differ in their ability to respond to a scorpion fish and that the shading shaded treatment in particular shows a poor ability to do so. Here's some first results for the stone. Uh, stones were, are generally quite attractive to, to triple fins because they don't like the sandy substrate on which we kept them. Uh, so uh, we expected them to, see, to be relatively close to the stone, which they were, and there was no difference between the two controls and the shading hat at the, the triple fin. However, when we presented the scorpion fish, all the triple fins were significantly further away from the scorpion fish, and moreover, just as predicted by our hypothesis, the shaded uh, triple fins were closer to the scorpion fish as the controls. Now, this is lab work. We repeated this in the field um, in, uh, at 15 meters depth, which was quite a challenge. We set up uh, 10 such enclosures. We wanted to do this under natural light conditions and uh, water quality and so on. This principle is very similar. Triplets of three different treatments inside these tanks were confronted with a stone or a scorpion fish. We oriented the tanks in two different orientations because, of course, we didn't know whether the position of the sun would have a play a role. So we had tanks where the fish were facing south and we had tanks where fish were facing north. So this is also why we split the data here because the results were different for these two orientations. In the north facing tanks, we could see the same effect as what we saw in the lab. Fish were all very much attracted by the stone. They kept the safe distance from the, or safer, longer distance from the scorpion fish. Uh, this was very significant. And also between the controls and the shaded treatment, there was a significant different, difference. Uh, you may not see this immediately from these bars. These are uh, paired data uh, within the triple fin triplet and as a consequence the error bars do not really represent uh, the significance level here because of the the, um, the pair design of the experiment. In the tanks on the south, uh, facing south, we did not see such an effect. Here it seemed as if all the triple fins found it relatively easy to recognize the scorpion fish. They were much further away from the scorpion fish than in this tank, so it seemed as if it was harder to detect the scorpion fish here. Uh, and perhaps because of that, it was particularly hard for the shaded fish, whereas here it seemed as if it was very easy for all the triple fins to recognize the scorpion fish. So uh, from these first uh, experiments, we conclude that yes, it's really true, shaded triple fins do seem to have difficulties recognizing scorpion fish. Um, in a further experiment, we then collected data immediately after releasing the triple fin. In this case, we released single individuals rather than triplets, and we did it in a different type of tanks. For purely logistical reasons, we moved up to 10 meters, which was easier. Um, and we made floats on which two of those enclosures were positioned. The nice thing is that it's uh, easier to approach. It's less technically less demanding in, in 10 meters. Um, and this is the, the technique that we we're still using up to today. Um, the fish released in these tanks again uh, were presented with a display compartment at one end of the tank. They were released in the middle they could decide to go to the other side of the tank, which was 50 centimeters long in this particular case. And over time, which is what I'm going to show now, we compared triple fins with transparent hats against triple fins with shading hats along this time axis since release. Each of these fish 
was recorded seven times manually by a diver uh, checking out these containers. So it looks a little bit messy at first, but if you look at these curves here, <clears throat> the paler, the, the more faded gray here is of the, uh, the transparent hat that the control had at the triple fin. They did not go very close to the, to the scorpion fish, and in fact, they started to move away very early as soon as they perhaps uh, started to realize that there was a scorpion fish there. This was different for the shaded hatted fish. <clears throat> they clearly came closer. This is the average curve. Um, and in fact, if we look at just these data points here, uh, within this seven centimeter limit here, 70% of the fish that ended up very close to the scorpion fish immediately after release uh, were shaded and only 21% of them were uh, of the clear headed type. So again, uh, an indication that those two types, these two types of treatments differed in their ability to recognize scorpion fish. So we do think that if you suppress light re redirection, that predator detection is hampered in these fish. However, what we haven't shown with this experiment is that this is due to what we think it is, namely the pupils of the scorpion fish. This is still a hypothesis. So we still have this problem that we have to show that it is the pupil that is the key for a triple fin to break a scorpion fish's camouflage. And here I'm giving you two pictures of scorpion fish. One is manipulated and one is not. And I allow you to guess which one is the manipulated one. Well, it's the one on the right. In reality, scorpion fish already have a pretty bright pupil. And in the paper by Santon and all published in 2018, we describe why we think that this is a strategy to reduce the conspicuousness of a black pupil um, because this light pupil, which is caused by several mechanisms that the fish uses, uh, that this light pupil blends in well with the rest of its body and might in general serve as a component of its camouflage. We generally expect fish and other animals to be particularly worried about black pupils because of course most animals will have black pupils for a very good reason that light is strongly absorbed inside an eye. So obviously that is not the case in uh, scorpion fish. So this is the, the natural situation. And so if we want to test whether the pupil is the key to break a scorpion fish camouflage, we actually have a bit of a double hypothesis here. On the one hand, we would suppose that triple fins respond strongly to dark pupils, just like many other animals are expected to do and are, well, in those where it's tested, they are known to do that. But in this particular case, we would expect them to also find bright pupils scary, not only because scorpion fish have bright eyes, but also because the triple fins generate increases in luminance in the eyes of these scorpion fish, right? So uh, it took a while to come up with the correct method to test this idea. Um, for quite some time, we tried to see whether we could manipulate the luminance of a scorpion fish pupil by also attaching various kinds of hats. That didn't work at all. In contrast to the triple fins, scorpion fish have an extremely uh, mucus rich skin and they are capable of expelling everything that you put on them uh, quite quickly. It certainly far too quickly um, in order to uh, be useful for an experiment. So we've already for two years now, or two seasons, I have to say, because last year doesn't count, um, for uh, two seasons, we started working with 3D printed scorpion fish models. And this is just a selection of the 44 models that we used this summer. Uh, some of them have no eyes, some of them do have eyes and there's different kinds of eyes. And the experiment that we carried out was that we gave triple fins a choice between two scorpion fish models. On the one hand, there was this one model with no eye, which we supposed would, should be relatively safe for a triple fin to approach. And on the other side, the triple fin were confronted with either models that have a bright pupil, 
which in, in reality is a see-through pupil. So what you see here is the background, more or less. So it has the same luminance of the environment. Then there's black pupils. We simply slide a black, uh, a black structure in the back of the, of the hole here. Or we have a black pupil including a lens. So we have some reflections on the outside, which tells the tropophins that there is a lens there. What we don't have here in this selection is a retroreflective lens because we specifically wanted to test whether triple fins are scared by black or transparent, translucent uh, pupils. Here I'm showing you um, a recording where we test this prediction. You see models on the left and on the right. A triple fin sits in the middle. The models are moving a little bit. Now all of a sudden the transparent separators are gone and in the remaining time the triple fin gets a chance to in inspect and evaluate the two models. Triple fins don't like to sit in the open. So this fish is extremely curious and attracted by either this object here or this object here because it's a bit of a darker space with some natural colors and now it starts to have a very close look at this guy here which is the model with the eye. You see it's it's moving in, an, in a jerky way, but this is 20 times accelerated. It's actually bobbing. It's doing push-ups. And this is a typical behavior that triple fins like to show when they see a scorpion fish. We have shown that in a publication just uh, recently. But this fish checks and checks and looks and checks. Uh, triple fins can come as close as 10 centimeters to a scorpion fish without any risk. Sorry. Um, so let's look a little bit further into the sequence. You see the fish is now moving towards the other, other model, which is the one without an eye, um, and comes closer and closer and checks it very clearly. But then it moves back to the other side again, has another look at the one with the eye. It comes even very close now. But despite the fact that it's now very close to this model, it still decides to hop over to the other side. And what it does eventually is that it crosses into this compartment here. And this is where we see this as a decision. So as soon as the fish leave the central area and get into the compartment of one of the two models, we see that as a choice. But you have soon seen in this recording that um, fish do indeed choose, compare, assess, evaluate, and then finally decide for one of the two options. Now, uh, we have uh, not analyzed this data set, I have to stress, so uh, I cannot give you some final results here, but I'm going to give you some uh, intriguing first hints at what or how the results could look like. Um, so just let me stress again, data analysis is very much in progress and what I'm going to tell you now might already be obsolete next week. So the question was, relative to an eyeless model, how do triple fins respond? Well, very much to our surprise, the black, the purely black pupil was not considered very scary. In fact, we saw quite a few triple fins going straight to this model relative to an eyeless model. Yeah? So it means, at least in certain cases, this seemed to be less um, dangerous. A bit scary perhaps was the one with a lens in the eye. The triple fins obviously seem to see a difference here. And finally, the most scary one was the one with the translucent eye where the fish could look through the eye, which uh, came as a surprise to be honest. I also noticed that the sample size is a little bit lower here than here and here because we put more models in this um, uh, these these uh, treatments because we actually did not expect to see uh, an effect here at all. But on the contrary, this was the strongest effect. In this case, um, well, in all these cases, um, I'm not going to speculate on statistical significance. I'm just showing you this as a trend and to make you aware of the fact that sometimes you think you know what to expect and then in reality it comes out quite differently. So this is certainly an effect that um, suggests to us that triple fins are 
very subtle in how they uh, evaluate danger. It seems as if the pupil type is really the key that they use to break a scorpionfish's camouflage. And under certain conditions, a scorpionfish without an eye, of course, this is, uh, I manipulated this image, the, a scorpionfish without an eye can even be more scary than a scorpionfish with a black eye, at least under certain conditions. So um, with this, I am going to round up. The conclusion, the very general conclusion I would like to make at this point is that yes, we do think that active photolocation, the active use of light to detect cryptic predators is plausible in triple fins. Um, triple fins is a system that we've been using for quite a while now. We have a lot of publications in which we looked at iris fluorescence and initially then that the ability that they can regulate their iris fluorescence. Here you can see the fluorescence, which is more conspicuous in deeper water, like 15 or 20 meters, but not in shallow water. Um, we know it can see its own fluorescence. We know it can catch more prey in blue environments. It controls the use of ocular sparks. Uh, we have a lot of its uh, key properties characterized and quantified. Uh, we know its behavior towards prey and predators. We know it can detect prey by means of active photolocation. That is something that I did not dwell on today, but uh, there is some evidence there, at least some uh, modeling evidence that suggests that that should be possible. The main message for today is uh, actually summarized in a paper that was published in the beginning of 2020. Um, it uh, contains a lot of the data that uh, I presented we do think that there is pretty good evidence that triple fins can detect predators by means of active photolocation. Obviously, just as I said in the beginning, there's very many fish that re-emit light with their eyes. I'm certainly not claiming that many of these are using this to illuminate something, but my prediction is that particularly the smaller ones that have very short interaction distances between themselves and their prey or between themselves and their predators or maybe also con specifics might be using these mechanisms to illuminate something, particularly the eyes of the others because the eyes have a good chance of being retroreflective. And if you have a retroreflector in your environment, that is the easiest target to go for. So if uh, some of the details that I provided uh, were maybe a little bit too much in depth, um, the bottom line here is we think there is something like echolocation with light in fish and um, that explains the, the title of my presentation as well. This work uh, has been done by very, very many people, many more people than what I listed here on this slide uh, because it's been a very slow process with lots of uh, drawbacks and development of new techniques and so on and so forth. But I'm actually quite proud uh, about my for my team and very grateful um, for being persistent <laughs> and being willing to uh, go on. Uh, we've got some, had some really good funding from the DFG and the Volkswagen Foundation. And with this, I uh, end my presentation and I thank you for your attention. And I'm very much looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nico, very much. That was that was really exciting. Um, yes, we do have a couple of questions, and uh, I suggest to immediately uh, dive in. Um, I probably just go by the by the order in which they were asked. Uh, so one question was about uh, chemiluminescent fish, um, you know, without sunlight, but they're producing their own light. Is that something that? Um, that you have considered at all in your research or know about in other ways? Uh, well, I've got, uh, so usually I always have chemiluminescent fish as uh, part of my uh, presentation. Um, but today I, uh, I uh, just hit them at the end in order to, because I was afraid that I would run out of my time. Uh, so the what I can show you here is the uh, flashlight fish. Flashlight fish are known to use chemiluminescence at night 
and they can switch this organ on and off. And as you notice, you this probably have to sorry, you probably have to share your, your the screen of the fish. Mm -hmm. It's in a perfect location to induce eye shine, retroreflective eye shine in other species. And in fact, this has already Nicole, been Nicole, sorry to interrupt you. Howland at all published a paper in 1992. Nicole, can you hear me? Calculate that the theoretical plausibility of this mechanism uh, to, of uh, working uh, is actually very high. So there's a very good possibility that chemiluminescence, at least in those chemiluminescent fish that have a chemiluminescent eye under the pupil, um, can um, see this. Ah, sorry, I noticed that uh, my my screen is not. Uh, I forgot to switch on my screen. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, sorry, that's part I missed. Here's my screen. Now you can see the the lantern fish, the flashlight fish, and the fact that they have this light organ just below the pupil. And so as soon as you see this kind of an arrangement where an organism has something that produces a lot of light just next to a pupil, then it's very likely that something like this might well be used to induce reflection in um, targets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, what about um, these ocular sparks that you described? Do you need sunshine or does it work with overcast skies? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, well, in fact, um, the ocular sparks really only work with uh, under sunshine. However, we do have a suspicion that maybe some fish might be specialized in using all of the light that comes down from the uh, substrate. That's the, that was the question, right? Uh, yeah, whether 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 it works with over uh, during overcast sky. Yes. So um, I'm going to show you. Ah, I need to share my screen again, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. This is something I have to get used to. Okay. Here's my screen again. Uh, well, in the in the water, we have this very funny and interesting phenomenon, which is called Snell's window, uh, which uh, predicts or really shows, and as shown on the right that even if the sun is very low on the horizon, due to refraction at the surface, it is coming from above for a fish or a diver or whoever is there. So the sunlight will always come to you in an angle of 97 degrees, a cone with an angle of 97 degrees, and everything outside this uh, circle is dark. And so if you see a picture like this, you can see the sun is on the edge. Well, this means the sun is on the horizon just before sunset. Um, what this means is that if the whole sky is covered with, with uh, clouds, I still have this circular light source in to on top of me. And it's not just the sun, it's the whole sky. And it seems as if some fish might use their eyes to generate a focused spot below their eyes that uh, focuses the whole sky using Snell's window. But that's speculation for the time being. Um, it's a, it seems like a, a plausibility, but uh, let's talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so there was a question to your design of the, um, uh, of, of the behavioral experiment where you placed your three groups of fish, the hatted, the control, and the the transparently hatted fish uh, together in, in their compartment, um, whether they would influence their behavior. So if the non-hatted fish see, see the scorpion fish and, and go away, right? Whether the others just follow and also go away in the hatted ones. Yes, obviously, but it obviously also uh, means that our approach was very conservative because if the shaded headed fish would have followed the fish that could see the scorpion fish better, we would not have seen an effect. Uh, nevertheless, this was a reason to, um, to uh, change the design of future experiments when out testing single individuals. We were thinking initially, well, the main reason actually for putting three fish in one tank is that uh, we had only 10 tanks. 
and it's extremely uh, work intensive to uh, put three fish in a tank in 15 meters depth and then observe them several times per day. And that's why uh, we decided to put all three treatments in a single tank, uh, because by doing so, the, um, the, uh, the sample size would be increased. Uh, what I also have to stress is that the statistical analysis takes into account the behavior of the three fish within a single group relative to each other. So I do think we're on the safe side. Uh, if we would have tested individual fish, we probably would have seen stronger effects. Mm -hmm. um, another question, I was actually quite intrigued in your video with the, with the 3D printed uh, triple fins, how the fish really went there, inspected everything and then went back. Um, how close can a triple fin go to to a scorpion fish before being eaten? Uh, well, actually, um, we we don't we don't know this very well, but um, there are uh, because of course we don't see scorpion fish eating triple fins very often, but we have done an experiment which. Uh, uh, in which we put triple fins in a container with a scorpion fish that was not uh, hidden behind glass. So triple fins and scorpion fish could interact directly with each other. And I have to say triple fins are extremely good at escaping attacks from scorpion fish. We had very few attacks and even fewer that were successful. Um, it seems as if triple fins can easily get as close as 10 centimeters to a scorpion fish without being caught. Uh, what triple fins can do, and I, I don't have a recording to show it, but uh, they can uh, they can swim away in an explosive way. So they can accelerate in a way that is that exceeds the acceleration of an attacking scorpion fish as long as the distance is big enough. If the mm -hmm. distance is very short, then obviously the scorpion fish has such a sucking power, the suction, the under pressure the scorpion fish can generate is too strong and the small fish is sucked in. Mm -hmm. But we do think that the detection distances that we have seen in our experiments are fitting well with the real risk in the real uh, world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what about the other way around, that ocular spark? Is it not giving away the triple fin to the scorpion fish and make it more detectable? Sorry, uh, I had my sound off because it was interfering. Thomas, you were probably saying something. Can you make? Yes, I was. I was asking whether uh, the ocular spark might not be dangerous for the triple fin because it makes it easier for the scorpion fish to find the triple fin because of the ocular spark. Uh, actually, that's a very nice question because uh, let's look at a slide like this here. So. There's a lot of fish that have these ocular sparks on all the time. And you need to show your screen again, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, uh, I apologize. <laughs> uh, now there's my screen again. Uh, so um, many fish and particularly free swimming fish, so fish that are plainly obvious and you can see them very easily and so on, they have their ocular sparks on all the time and they're very conspicuous. In triple fins, triple fins, as I showed, can switch their ocular sparks on and off. And so most of the time the ocular spark is off. Sometimes they switch it on and then off again and then on again. And what we think is that because it's such a small dot of bright light at a certain distance for the scorpion fish, it might even be below the spatial resolution of the scorpion fish because scorpion fish are uh, expected to have a, a poorer spatial resolution than um, triple fins, for instance. Okay. Uh, so, so we do think that this is probably one of the reasons why they switch their ocular sparks on and off and why ocular sparks are very small in the triple fins. The fact that other fish that behave very openly and clearly uh, don't hide their ocular sparks suggests that uh, this might there might be something there. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about the polarization of the light? Um, did you did you look at that? Both of the reflected light that's coming back to the uh, to the triple fin, or or the light that's emitted by the ocular spark? Yeah, so I, so I get that question quite a bit, and and of course there is some some good uh, evidence for the ability of fish to see polarized light, but uh, we should not forget that um, I think even in fish, 
the ability to see polarized light depends on quite strong light and quite strong reflection. In this particular case, we have light going back and sorry, I'm, again, I forgot my screen, right? Uh, I'm going to show a slide um, to illustrate this. So what we, the problem that we have with this system is that, um, of course, we lose a lot of light. Uh, the light that goes down to the triple fin is being focused and reflected. So perhaps this is polarized. There is a possibility that this might be the case. But then it goes into the scorpion fish eye, which sits at a certain distance that it needs to be reflected and reach the triple fin's eye again. And so I think this is a pathway where so much of the light might be changed or reduced in intensity that um, I would be really surprised if triple fins would have the luxury to include something like, uh, f f like a polarization on top of this. But mm -hmm. I can't exclude it. We've never looked at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, active photolocation is shown uh, in fish, but is it specific for fish or do you know uh, that in any other species, non-fish non species? Well, this, uh, green animals or, yes. or even on land, I don't know. Well, there's two things that, uh, that, I, can, uh, that I can show maybe in this context. One is uh, just remind you of the fact that the interaction distances are extremely small in water. Yeah, uh, fish that are really each other's enemies can pass each other over distances of uh, just a few centimeters without the enemy, the predator, being able to capture its prey. And this has certainly something to do with the density of water. Uh, a, a, a predator on land can be much, much faster. Think about a bird striking a mouse on the ground. That predator can be much faster and, and surprise its prey with a much higher speed than a fish would be able to do in the water. Uh, I think so short distances make it much more probable that active photolocation is possible. And the second thing is uh, this uh, Snell's window uh, issue. Because of course, in water, the light always comes from above. Nobody is used to a situation where the light all of a sudden comes from the side. That is very unusual. This picture of the barracudas illustrates this. Water is pretty dark. If you look at the left and the right, then the sun is never going to be to the left or your right. But reflective structures, they will be able to send light to you. And this is why I think aquatic environments are particularly suitable for something like active photolocation. I do not exclude that it's possible in terrestrial environments, but I think the constraints are more serious uh, in uh, terrestrial environments. Okay, uh, Nico, I think we are actually running out of time. <laughs> um, I would like to thank you again for uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, it was um, it was lovely. <laughs> thank you for participating in this journal club, and thank you for the audience for for great questions. And um, I hope you will join us again for our next journal club which is probably in two or three months after the summer break. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you, Nico. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you everyone for uh, listening in. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, the questions too. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.